Nurses and carers, we place our life in their hands, but are we always safe? This is the series that tells the stories of those who take the lives of men and women they're supposed to care for. Keeping a low profile, a surveillance team watches the home of a woman who's complained she is being harassed, a woman who herself is a murder suspect. It was denial, 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 and that fitted exactly what we knew about the history of Alison Firth as a nurse. She was a liar. Nurse Alison Firth's weapon of choice was a drug, but she'd chosen Hemineverin, a sedative all too easily detected. Never smell Hemineverin liquid. It has an incredibly pungent, very distinctive and very unpleasant smell. Knowing someone has murdered is one thing, proving it another. What evidence would the surveillance team turn up in the case of a nurse who had lost her sense of smell? Nurse Alison Firth, alone with her patient, Alice Grant. Alice Grant was an 86-year-old lady. She had terrible health problems. She'd had a stroke. She was very frail. She was an old lady who was coming towards the end of her life, very frail old lady, receiving care in a nursing home. She needed to be made comfortable so that that end of her life came while she was in the best possible sort of circumstance and, and being looked after. She was as vulnerable as anybody could possibly be. Looking after Alice was not a labour of love for her reluctant carer. Alison Firth was not always as attentive as she should be to her patient's needs, or anyone else's for that matter. Often late for work, always keen to leave early. She wasn't a person who really cared about her job. I don't think nursing was a vocation for Alison Firth. I think it was just a means to get paid. Scruffy, some would say dirty too. In nursing, not something which is acceptable. People who are always late, people who are slovenly, people who don't care, they really don't belong in a caring environment. Alison Firth was representing the nursing profession. The nursing profession is there to keep people healthy. And while not everybody needs to be obsessionally clean, at least being reasonably clean, not having food down your clothes, is the very minimum that's needed in order for patients to have trust. It says a lot about them. If they don't care about themselves and how they present themselves, how are they going to care about somebody else? She is performing not just specific nursing care, but she's also performing daily caring tasks. If she looks as if she can't feed herself without spilling food down herself and doesn't care if she does, that tells me she is highly unlikely to be caring really rigorously and prioritizing the people she's looking after. People like Alice Grant. Dr. Sarah Jarvis, a practicing GP, discovered a consistent theme about the work of nurse Alison Firth. She was qualified, but far from committed. Alison Firth consistently showed that she was lazy, which is not something that is consistent with professionalism because it means that you're likely to be putting your patients at risk, that she doesn't take her responsibilities seriously and that she can't be trusted. In fact, many who had worked with Alison Firth had drawn the same conclusion. She was just lazy. A further ingredient contributing to the person Alison Firth had become by the time she was 36, a worrying employment record which reveals how she was no stranger to moving 
from one care home to another, 27 times in just 16 years. She has a history of moving on quite quickly in her employment. That in itself indicates a level of instability, psychological instability as well, as well as actual instability, which is an indicator of Im emotional immaturity. Alison Firth had been a nurse throughout Scotland, often working under different local authorities or for different private nursing chains. That, ironically, may have helped her plausibility. Getting people new to her to accept her was something that she had to do a lot. I think Alison Firth was probably very good at creating a positive first impression. She would probably be very friendly, she knew what to say, she was a manipulative person. She was not, however, any good at all in maintaining that. She couldn't keep it up for a long time and that's one of the reasons for the transient nature of her employment. She had to keep moving on because she kept getting found out. Many junior doctors these days move around the country. They may have a husband or a wife, indeed, who gets a job somewhere else. They have to move. Exactly the same thing will apply to a nurse. We have long gone past the days where people were born in the place their parents were born, and they die in the place that their parents died. But there is a world of difference between that and having 27 jobs in 16 years. Lazy and not unrelated, often moving from one job to another, Alison Firth in the year 2000, by now married with a child and living in the northeast of England. There is a final troubling ingredient to consider about nurse Alison Firth. Hers was a role which saw her potentially becoming immune to witnessing people die. To Donna Young, as a forensic psychologist, the peripatetic nature of Firth's employment is telling not least because Nurse Firth would have seen death in so many places. What really struck me is the number of different places that she'd worked in, indicating the number of different elderly people that she must have over her career seen die. And just the psychological impact of that daily exposure to death. It's almost like that repeated exposure to death, which is completely abnormal in human experience. Normally, if we're unlucky, we see three or four people over our lifetimes die. Somebody in this type of role sees many, many, many people. It ages them very rapidly in terms of their emotional response to mortality. It completely reduces their emotional response to death to zero. It reduces their empathy for the experience of a dying person to zero. Put simply, Alison Firth lived every day with people dying. Another elderly person passing away became routine to her. Many in the medical profession face death on a daily basis, and the vast majority are saddened by what they see. But Alison Firth had a quality which set her apart from her colleagues some of whom noticed that Alison saw patients as no more than a statistic, here today, gone tomorrow. Clearly, if you don't see others as being real and you have somebody elderly and frail and you're used to death and it's just a matter of time, you've seen it so many times, it's just a small step then to push somebody over that line. It seems obvious now. But wasn't the lazy, always on the move, sensitised to death Alison Firth a real risk to patients? Colin Sutton is a murder detective who spent years uncovering killers. It's, uh, it's never easy to spot a killer. Killers are ordinary people. They're people like you and me who are thrust into extraordinary circumstances quite often and end up being killers. You know, uh, very few killers plan to be killers. Most murders happen spontaneously. They're, they're, it's a, a set of circumstances causes something to happen. Those who go out intent on killing are few and far between, but they're no easy to spot. You know, they're, they're just ordinary people who do things that are beyond the pale. 
It was 1999 when the not-so-angelic Alison Firth had moved from Scotland to the northeast of England. She found a home for herself, husband and child in a pleasant housing estate at Kingston Park near Newcastle-upon-Tyne. Her latest job was in a care home, now closed in Gateshead. Alison Firth just appears to be a, a nurse, a normal nurse. Uh, she has a, a history of a poor employment record, but nevertheless, she's a nurse, and she's somebody doing that job that uh, you know we all respect, and, and the last person perhaps you'd, you'd think of being a killer. Residents were elderly, infirm, often irascible, always in need of help. One colleague noticed how irritated Alison would sometimes become with the patients. If a patient or a resident was demanding in some way, not necessarily demanding through their personality, but just through the, their condition, their physical condition, maybe their, their psychological condition, they would be seen as a nuisance, somebody who was getting in the way of you know, them having a rest or doing something else that repetitive nature of caring, and it is a repetitive job. Maybe for somebody like Alison Firth, she'd have seen those people as a nuisance. Alice Grant was not an easy patient. She needed a lot of attention. Nurse Firth was never happy tending to her. She was coming to the end of her life. She was quite dependent on her carers. Dependent on Alison Firth, a nurse who didn't like patients, and who one day said something about Alice which shocked one of her colleagues. There was a, a strange comment that was made to members, uh, colleagues, was that uh, she did mention something along the lines of, I wish I could help her, give her something to help her along the way. When Alison Firth made that incredibly callous statement, it spoke volumes about her opinion and it spoke volumes about her lack of empathy, of humanity, of professionalism. Just how much danger was Alice Grant in from the nurse who was supposed to care for her? Alice Grant was in no fit state mentally or physically to defend herself or raise an alarm if she was being threatened. Alice Grant was about as physically dependent, as helpless as it is possible to be. She couldn't speak. She couldn't move. She couldn't even feed herself or swallow without help. She was enormously vulnerable. She couldn't turn herself to prevent bed sores. She relied on others for that. She couldn't feed herself, so she had to be fed carefully to make sure that she didn't breathe food into her lungs and develop an infection. Her immune system would not have been working well, so she was enormously prone to infection. Because she didn't move around, she was hugely at risk of blood clots if she wasn't turned regularly. She would need hourly, half-hourly attention by somebody. And maybe Alison Firth just thought that was too much. Alice's family often visited her. The mother they had grown up with was not the elderly, infirm lady now needing care around the clock. Alice Grant was a much-loved person. Fundamentally, deep down, she was just like any other human being. She was someone's mother, sister, grandmother. She had people who remembered her when she was young and vibrant. And everybody today could be an Alice Grant one day. And yet, Alison Firth seemed completely incapable or totally unwilling to recognize her as a human being. This was a vulnerable old lady uh, who was nearing the end of her life and she was being looked after by people who you would expect to be professional. Her family expected her to be comfortable and safe. A member of the care home team, a cleaner, on duty one evening in May that year, noticed Alison Firth next to Alice. 
the nurse had a syringe containing a brown liquid in her hand. Nothing which would cause the cleaner to raise an alarm. Nurse Firth surely knew what she was doing. A little later on, the same team member noticed that Alice was slumped in her bed. She appeared in great discomfort. The cleaner was concerned for Alice Grant's well-being and comfort. There's a, a remarkable scene that happens where Alice is there, she's needing care, she, she needs turning, and Alison Firth is, is tending to her, and there's a cleaner nearby. And the cleaner, out of humanity, trying to be helpful, says, shall I go and get you another pillow so you can make her more comfortable? And Alison Firth turns around and says, oh, don't worry about that, she's, she's going to die soon anyway, it doesn't really matter. Now, that's, you know, so callous, and it's so atypical of what we expect of, of, of our nurses. What had been in the syringe? Was it anything to do with the condition that Alice Grant was now in, struggling for breath? As Alice clearly fought to stay alive, Nurse Firth made a telephone call. Alison Firth called Alice's son and warned him that perhaps his mum didn't have long to go. And of course, she would have known that because of what she'd done. And when he arrived, she was sitting there with Alice, putting on this picture of the caring nurse. But that was a perfect way to divert suspicion away from her, but not just away from her, divert suspicion. Everybody thought that Alice was going to die anyway. If she was sitting there looking caring, why would anybody suspect anything? On the evening in May 2000 that Alice's son was called to be by the bedside of Alice Grant, she did indeed die, as Nurse Firth had warned on the telephone call. In the hours that followed, News of Alice's passing did not shock or surprise most nursing staff, and visiting doctors at the care home were also not surprised. It would have been probably no surprise to a lot of people had she passed away in and around that time. And in fact, the doctor who attended was willing to certify the fact that uh, she had died probably of infirmity and old age. It wouldn't have been a surprise had she died. I can only imagine that Alison Firth thought she would get away with this because Alice Grant was close to death and therefore she could have died at any time. Her grieving relatives would have been asked whether they wanted a post-mortem perhaps or the doctor who came to certify the death might have discussed it with the local coroner who would have said, was she expected to die? Yes. The doctor would have replied quite truthfully because from her condition she could have died at any time. Therefore, Alison Firth presumably not only thought that there was nothing ethically wrong with hastening that death, but that nobody would ever suspect that she had done it. Should someone have been checking on Alison Firth? We cannot have every nurse, every doctor, every healthcare assistant in this country observed by somebody else every time they are working, for every working hour. We hardly have enough nurses and healthcare professionals to do the job, let alone a spare for each one, to observe them and check that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing and what they say they're doing. So that May night is when the life of the mother of three, Alice Grant, ended. Sad, but given her age and condition, inevitable, and at first confirmed as natural by a doctor. Alison Firth, who had made the call to Alice's son, remained nearby if needed. She had been the last person who had tended to her, appearing by her bedside with a syringe. But the colleague of Nurse Firth's at the care home who had seen her was suspicious. Well, what set of alarm bells ringing was that uh, one of the members of staff had seen some behavior by Alison Firth, the nurse who was on duty in the room in the hours preceding Alice's death. And specifically, she smelt the, the presence of a drug which was known to be a sedative. And she thought what she saw was the nurse actually feeding Alice the drug at the time, which she thought was strange. Uh, she didn't think it was right. And, and when she went in and sort of challenged the situation, Alison Firth made sort of clumsy attempts to try and clear up and dismiss the comments and, and remove the, the drug bottle from the room. And, and this bothered 
that, that member of staff to the extent that uh, she thought about it for probably, she's probably slept in it and then rang the police and thought, no, this isn't right, and reported the matter to the police, and that's where our investigation kicked off. What was in that syringe? The allegation was that the victim had received a drug that she probably shouldn't have been getting at that time, and that drug may have contributed to her death. So we needed to conduct a forensic post-mortem and identify if there was any normal explanation for death, any natural cause of death, or if, in fact, the, the administration of this drug had, in fact, led to her death. The initial post-mortem in the circumstances was inconclusive. However, the toxicology started to report back through the samples that we had taken was that the victim had high levels, beyond therapeutic levels of the heminevrin drug in her system, which would have led us to suspect that it may have caused her death. Heminevrin is a drug that Nurse Firth will have come across. It's a short-acting hypnotic. It puts people to sleep and sedative. It calms them down. It also reduces the risk of convulsions, of seizures. It's highly likely, therefore, that in a career that spans 16 years, Alison Firth would have come across this drug on several occasions. She would have seen how quickly it acted and she would have seen how it sedated people. Now, sedation is potentially dangerous if you do too much of it for anybody. But for somebody like Alice, who was very, very vulnerable in terms of her breathing, this may well have been something that Alison Firth could easily have assumed would suppress her breathing and stop her from breathing at all. It is one thing to find a drug in somebody's bloodstream, another thing altogether to prove murder. The toxicology showed the drug had been administered, so it then led us on to the, the ongoing inquiry to do that. And proving that causation was quite a challenge, not just a challenge for us as investigators, but a challenge for the experts, the toxicologists, the pharmacists and the pathologists to satisfy themselves beyond reasonable doubt that that drug had in fact caused Alice's death. Had a dose of heminevrin caused the death of Alice Grant? And if so, was it Alison Firth who'd given it to her? Nurse Firth, it was to be discovered, had a rare olfactory condition. Her ability to smell was very poor. From the start, this was not a clear-cut case of murder, but that fact would become crucial. There was something about the witness who had seen nurse Alison Firth with a syringe near Alice Grant's bed that Firth and the police knew all about. It gave nurse Firth the chance to muddy the investigating waters. She was an individual that was known to the police, but, but she had a job, she was holding down a job, and she saw something that wasn't right. The treatment of a vulnerable old lady nearing the end of her life, and, and she quite rightly reported what she saw to the police to allow us to investigate whether there had been any wrongdoing or not. Detectives began to look for other evidence. They received reports of Nurse Firth's behaviour, which to her colleagues seemed unusual. Just after Alice Grant dies, Alison Firth suddenly becomes conscientious. She's cleaning around the bed. She's cleaning the bedside furniture. and. It could well be that what she's trying to do is remove the traces of what she's done. The use of the drug is hard to hide. It smells a lot. I read a pharmaceutical journal when I was a medical student, which I've never forgotten, which had its top tips for pharmacology and the olfactory system. In other words, pharmacology and your sense of smell. And one of those was never smell heminevrin liquid. It has an incredibly pungent, very distinctive and very unpleasant smell. But not one which Alison Firth would necessarily have detected. The downfall, perhaps, for Alison Firth was that she had a severely restricted sense of smell. So she's using this stuff, using it to kill Alice Grant, but she doesn't realise that the smell is betraying it to everybody else. Alison Firth denied administrating the drug. 
denied being able to smell the drug in the room when other witnesses could clearly smell the, the drug in the room. And, and you need to know that uh, the drug him and Everin has quite a pungent smell and is quite noticeable. Uh, I even went to the extent of checking it out myself and uh, to try and understand why those witnesses c could in fact be so certain about it. It is a really pungent drug. Powerful evidence then. Enough perhaps to get a conviction, but no detective can be complacent. Perhaps Firth could say that she had administered the drug for perfectly good medical reasons. The investigation was now in full swing. Had she been cleaning the room to somehow clear the notoriously pungent smell of the drug? Had her phone call to Alice's son been a ruse to cover up her guilt? She had made the comment that Alice should hurry up and die. Had she helped her along the way? And if she had killed Alice Grant, how could it be proved? Step by step, the investigation unfolded. First, had Alice been definitely killed by the drug Hemineverin? The autopsy offered certainty. Yes, in fact, the administration of that drug was in such quantities that it did, in fact, cause uh, Alice's death. So though very ill, it was the drug which had caused Alice's death. Anticipating a defence is not always easy, but Hem and Everin can be applied for perfectly good reasons. Had nurse Alison Firth been innocently administering something to Alice that she needed? It's not always that straightforward. The drug is commonly used amongst elderly patients to help them sleep at night and to, to, to help sedate them. It was used commonly in that nursing home. It had been used on Alice previously, but it was the circumstances in which she was given it that weren't right. And the fact that it appeared that the nurse, Alison Firth, had tried to cover up the fact that she'd just given her this drug. For what reason, we don't know. We should try to sedate her, we should try to make her more comfortable. We don't know. The toxicology tests had shown a huge dose of a drug which would kill rather than sedate a patient, something an experienced nurse would know. Alison Firth was confident in the use of drugs. It's what she'd been doing for all of her working life. She knew the effect of drugs. She knew about the signing out system. She knew how to manage the measuring of drugs. The evidence appeared so overwhelming that surely Firth would confess. But no, Alison Firth denied it. So we had to have a bit look at her background in terms of what was she like as a nurse. It was when examining Firth's background that the case against her became really strong. Her own past was about to catch up with her. What we were starting to uncover here was a history of a nurse who was considered to be lazy, unprofessional, cuts corners, and a bit of a liar. And then there was the comment about wishing she could give Alice something to help her along the way. The interpretation of the witnesses and, and us as investigators was it's, she wished she could give her something to help her die. Uh, that's our interpretation. I think that's probably the, the only interpretation in the circumstances, which is a strange comment for a nurse, because nurses are there to help people. Firth was formally arrested. A local newspaper published her name. And then strange things began to happen. She told police that someone had left a warning on her car, a miniature coffin placed under her windscreen. She's almost creating a smoke screen. Perhaps the person who's hurting her is the person actually who, who her Alice. Because she started to say that she was a victim of, of harassment and maybe even stalking. Incidents started happening uh, around her home address. She alleged that somebody had lit a fire to some uh, bedding outside the back of her house. She alleged that somebody had fired gunshots in and around her house. She alleged that she had received letters and notes threatening her. So she really was saying, look at me, look at me, as a victim, and, and thinking that that would be enough to divert attention away from her. She used it as an opportunity to try and discredit one of the key witnesses, the witness who had actually seen her administering the drug which for me was a desperate attempt to try and up her own defence and try and distance herself from actually doing it. Jim Napier, who's the detective dealing with the case, good experienced copper, and 
he's told by Alison Firth, look, I'm getting all this hassle, I'm getting a fire set, I've got a, a card shaped like a coffin being put under the uh, windscreen wiper of my car. So he doesn't tell her, but he thinks, OK, if this is happening, it needs to be stopped, we'll investigate. And he sets up a surveillance, he sets up a watch on Alison Firth's house, doesn't tell her. Albeit she was uh, a suspect in our investigation, she was potentially also a victim of somebody who was targeting her because of a, the allegation or because of the fact that she'd been publicly identified. So we had a duty to try and find out who was doing this. The pleasant housing estate where Firth lived was about to be observed, specifically her home. She had claimed someone had tried to set fire to her house, provided evidence of petrol-soaked rags. A surveillance operation was established. Through some covert policing means, we identified and we actually watched Alison Firth spreading petrol around her own house, in her own doorway, her own windows. And all of these complaints about harassment uh, and stalking, they watched her putting bricks through her own windows and then saying that somebody was out there harassing her. And the officers that are watching there, what do they find? They find Alison Firth herself coming out, pouring petrol and setting a fire. She's actually the perpetrator of all this harassment she says that she's getting. Uh, and she's obviously using that as a, trying to use that as a, a way to deflect the blame from her for what she's done when she killed Alison. And when confronted with that, she admitted that she had made the whole thing up uh, and, and was actually convicted of attempting to pervert the course of justice in respect of that behaviour alone. In making her claims, she had tried to suggest to the police that the star witness had lied. Alison Firth was a nurse, seemingly, without a conscience. She is a woman who is completely without compassion, who is completely without care, who has interest in nobody but herself. Her only focus will have been self-preservation. But she probably was not intelligent enough to preserve herself consistently. But as long as Alison Firth could mount a credible defence, there was a chance that she could stay out of prison. Her case was simple. She had not applied the killer drug. The drug could have been applied by anybody in the care home. She had initially claimed that she'd been targeted for harassment, evidence perhaps that somebody hated her enough to make up stories. Whatever, she did not have to prove her innocence. It was for the police to prove their case. The difficulty is, is that if, you know, the, the, this is a case that was based all upon circumstantial evidence, really. There's no smoking gun or, or, or there's nobody seeing Alison Firth injecting the ham and everin into the food that she then gave to Alice Grant or injecting it into her body. It's a circumstantial case and circumstantial cases have to be built up piece by piece, little by little, until the overall effect becomes that the jury will convict. But there's always a worry for the investigator that, you know, have you got enough? Is there enough? Does that, are you painting a picture which is compelling? Is it going to be conclusive for the jury? She'd been in 27 jobs in 16 years and often been caught out lying before being asked to leave. But she'd still managed to get another job without a problem. Was she now about to get away with murder? A jury was called to Newcastle Crown Court to hear the case of the Crown against nurse Alison Firth. She denied it in court, she denied it in the witness box. What you've clearly got in Alison Firth is somebody who's practised at manipulating and convincing people. She's had this terrible work record but always managed to get herself into another job somehow. She's got the presence of mind, you may think, or, or the cunning to try and conduct this hate campaign against herself to try and deflect blame. It's a situation detectives hate because you, you know you're on the right lines, you know you've got the killer, you know you've got the person responsible, but it's such a hard job to try and make sure you get yourself enough evidence that's going to convince that jury. What verdict would the jury reach? Colin Sutton is a seasoned former murder squad detective. He has arrested some of Britain's most notorious killers. 
One of the facts of his life is that murderers often deny their guilt despite overwhelming evidence. What does it take to get a case over the line? The difficulty is with, with the jury system that we have is it, it, it takes only a couple, handful of jurors to have a doubt and you've got a not guilty verdict. You know, the defence don't have to prove anything. They just have to create that shadow of doubt over the, the, the safety of the conviction. The prosecution offered its argument. Alison Firth, a nurse, had the means and the knowledge to kill Alice. You're trained in how to uh, prevent pain and suffering. The other side of the coin is that you know how to use the drugs in a much more destructive way as well. If you know how to use the drugs, then you can use them for your own purposes. So she knew how, but what had to be shown was that it was Alison Firth who'd actually administered the drug. The difficulty for Jim Napier in this case was you had, you know, scientific evidence saying Alice Grant was poisoned, no doubt about that, but that didn't tell him who poisoned her. So to find who did it, you've got to look at who had the motive to do it, who had the opportunity, who was there at the time when it could have been done, and any other kind of means and circumstances which tend to prove that it was Alice and Firth. It's a very satisfying case to build when you succeed, but you're always worried you're not going to succeed because it is so difficult. What about motive? Firth had complained that Alice was a labour-intensive patient. Staff gave evidence to say that Firth was often lazy and didn't want to tend to Alice's needs. Alice was just too much trouble for Firth. But seeing that sort of attitude was hardly new to those who had worked alongside Alison Firth in the past. The main reason, she left so many care homes. A number of different places, whether it be nursing homes or hospitals, the, the same sort of information was coming back from former colleagues, from personnel records, was that she was pretty much an unprofessional and problematic nurse. Alison Firth's work history was looked into. There was really a pattern of getting a job, being lazy, not doing things uh, unless she really had to, trying to get other people to do things for her. And she repeated this. She, this, this was her normal working life. This is how she worked. And it looked like in this case, really, it was simply that she was, really couldn't be bothered to keep Alice Grant alive. You know, it was easy, it made her job easier if this poor old lady died. There's no question in my mind that Alison Firth, quite simply, should not have been working as a nurse. She had falsified timesheets. All right, that's not harming patients, but that tells you everything about the sort of person that she was. She was prepared to commit fraud. If you think about the duties of a nurse from the Nursing and Midwifery Code of Conduct, prioritising people is first. The only people that Alison first seemed to prioritise was herself. Nursing in those homes is so physically and emotionally draining. You've got to like what you're doing. You've got to like the camaraderie. You've got to like making people's lives better. That wasn't Alison Firth. The witness who had seen Firth administering some sort of substance via a syringe stuck resolutely to her story. Firth's behavior was something unacceptable. Hers proved to be crucial evidence. The witness who spotted the syringe and suggested that the heminevrine may have been administered to, uh, to, to Alice Grant was, was absolutely crucial in, in this case because it was her that brought the, the whole suspicion uh, to the notice of the police. Otherwise, you've got a very sick 86-year-old lady who's died. It's the sort of case that may well slip through the net if nobody saw anything. Interestingly, Alison Firth tried to blame the cleaner. She thought the cleaner, who was the witness, was vulnerable to being set up and that she could set her up to take the fall for this murder. A staff member had called in the police the day after Alice had died. Not even Nurse Firth's colleagues thought her innocent, and neither did the jury. She was convicted of murder and sentenced to a minimum term of 17 years. She was later struck off from ever practicing as a nurse again. No patients will have to suffer at the hands 
of Alison Firth in the future. Alice was in a very bad way before her death, all the more reason to have been looked after. One would imagine that when you've got a patient like that, uh, a nurse, a member of a caring profession, would see it as, as a job that they needed to do to the absolute best of their ability. Uh, you know, it, it, it's something that's very important, and you'd think it would be important to a nurse to try to make someone's last weeks or months uh, as comfortable as they possibly could be. Instead, what she had left of life was taken from Alice by a woman Donna Youngs believes had simply lost the ability to empathise with those that she was supposed to care for. She had seen the death of patients too often for it to register any longer as something out of the ordinary. When they're up close and personal with death, with dying people on a daily basis, what it does is radically distort their understanding of other people's human existence, of the fact that other people have a life story, have an identity. Later inquiries failed to turn up any evidence which would lead to further charges related to how Nurse Firth had treated her patients down the years. But a life sentence for murder was achieved. She was described on conviction as a disgrace to her profession. It's a statement that I would so agree with. There was plenty of opportunity for her to admit what she had done and save the family the agony, justify what she had done, although that's a harder one. But no, it was denial, 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 and that fitted exactly what we knew about the history of Alison Firth as a nurse. She was a liar. There is never a happy ending to a murder. But if there is one tiny silver cloud from this, it is that note has been taken that somebody who was so clearly unsuited and should never have been a nurse should have been picked up and wasn't. So care homes and hospitals have now had updated guidance which we can only hope will ensure that somebody who is so blatantly unprofessional, who is so repeatedly performing in a substandard way, will never be put in the position where someone's life relies on them again. That is horrific. The breach of trust is horrendous. And it doesn't matter whether she was days, hours, weeks away from death. Nobody has the right to accelerate that process, and Alison Frost did that. She made that decision, and it's wrong in every sense of the word. We don't expect for nurses, and that's why my colleague made the comment at the time that she's a disgrace to her profession, because nurses aren't like that. Nurses are carers, nurses look after people. In 2017, after serving 17 years in prison, Alison Firth was given parole. She's living somewhere in Northern Britain. She will never be allowed to tend to patients again and can be returned to prison if she breaches the conditions of her parole. <laughs>